This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day, wherever you're listening from, and welcome. It's episode 477 of IAQ Radio. It's Friday, September 15th, and it's 2017. This week, we're going to continue our hurricane watch as recovery from Harvey continues in Texas, and now we have recovery starting in Florida from Irma and also in the Caribbean, where we hope to have uh, Addison Christian from St. Croix, but I know the cell phones are a little spotty down there. But we do have John Lapoter and Josh Winton calling in from Florida, so we'll be right back with them. Let's first thank our marquee sponsors. IAQ Radio marquee sponsors are John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at IAQ.net. Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. It's the 2017 Healthy Building Summit, November 2nd through the 4th, at Seven Springs Mountain Resort in the gorgeous Laurel Highlands of southwestern Pennsylvania. Join industry leaders and educators as they discuss research to practice navigating changing industries. It's two and a half days of IEQ, remediation, building science, and home performance. Marquee sponsors include John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Particles Plus, count on us. Exhibitors are AEML Microbiology Laboratories, True Tech Tools, Prism Analytical Technologies. Register now at HealthyBuildingsSummit.com or call 814-754-4808. That's HealthyBuildingsSummit.com or call 814-754-4808. All right, don't forget to thank our sponsors for their support of IAQ Radio when you inquire about their services or products. And also, don't forget, we have continuing education credits available. Just email me at joe.hughes at iaqtraining.com. Let's turn it over to the Z-Man who was able to call in from up in New York for today's show for today's IAQ Radio trivia question. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry to report there was no correct answer to last week's IQ Radio trivia question, which dealt with the word hurricane. The origins of the word hurricane are either from the Spanish Carib term harassin, which means god of evil, or from hurrican, the name of the Mayan storm god. The IQ Radio question for today, Friday, September 15, 2017, has been sponsored by Ideas, the solution chemistry company creating unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here is today's trivia question. Why do hurricanes have women's names? Back to you, Joe. All right. Thank you, Cliff. It looks like Addison Christian was able to get in, and I know we've got John Lapoter, we've got uh, Eric Shapiro calling in, and Josh Winton. So, gentlemen, welcome all, and uh, let's say hello one at a time. John, let's start with you. Um, I know you're driving, and I hope we're going to be able to uh, keep you on the line here throughout the show. Uh, Tell listeners a little bit about the current situation in Florida and uh, where you're headed. Well, Lydia and I have been working from our mobile office uh, since the hurricane hit. We personally remain without power, um, and we're we're staying with uh, my son. Uh, We're moving from the Orlando Central Florida area to the New Smyrna Beach uh, East Coast area to uh, work with some of our clients there and and survey the damage. 
It's a, an amazing stretch of damage that has crossed through the state of Florida. Um, the, the biggest concerns were initially uh, power outages, uh, but then the restoration contractors started reporting uh, the problems with getting fuel to uh, run their generators so they could actually do anything. Um, the fuel issue has been eased substantially. The power issue, maybe 50%. Um, I would say that in central Florida, most of our damage was caused by uh, associated tornadoes that uh, were created by the hurricane. And, John, before we go uh, over to Josh, earlier today we talked and, and you, you said this is not, we haven't even reached the peak yet of some of the flooding. Could you expand on that a little? Well, the St. John's River, for example, flows north. So a lot of the rainwater and hurricane water is actually continuing to move north through central Florida. And we're having a secondary flooding, essentially in slow motion, as many of the major rivers in Florida are, are rising and causing flood damage that is completely, I, I wouldn't say ignored, but not a focus of mainstream, mainstream media. To give you just a little bit of an example, the Santa Fe River, Oklahoma River, Peace River, Withlacoochee River, St. John's River, Little Wakaiba River, all have not yet crested. Those are just the major river bodies in Florida that are continuing to rise. These will be hundreds and hundreds of additional homes that will be flooded after, a week after the hurricane is hit. Okay, so that's John Lapoterre, folks. He's the owner uh, with his wife Lydia of Orlando, Florida-based Indoor Air Quality Solutions. They've been uh, running that company since 2001. John is also the Indoor Air Quality Association's current president. They're both licensed mold assessors and certified indoor environmental consultants. Next up, we've got Josh Winton. He's the owner of Discrete Restoration and Discrete Protect Systems of Pompano Beach, Florida, He's got over a decade of experience in water damage and mold remediation, uh, but he's also got a bachelor's degree in technical uh, management and associates in computer engineering, so he's kind of a rare restoration pro with expertise in information technology plus his experience in the field. Um, I also wanted to talk to Josh. Josh, can you give us a little update on where you're at, uh, what you're looking at? Uh, well, the past two days have been crazy, uh, like John kind of alluded to here, and uh, especially him jumping over on the East Coast, I am firsthand absolutely dumbfounded at how much this East Coast was impacted by not even so much the floodwaters, just with the driving rains. I know over there on the West Coast, they're dealing with a lot of the floodwaters and things of that sort. Over here on the East Coast, fortunately, we're dealing with the driving rains, so obviously a much more clean caliber of water overall, but... Uh, today was actually the first day this week that we were supposed to have a little bit of an easy introduction into our workday, aside from the fact that the building we were headed to, to do some light mitigation work, had a, a chiller system on the roof for a water tower that apparently backed up and flooded out three floors. So it seems like if it isn't hurricane damage, it's everything else. And... Uh, like John was saying, the gasoline shortages are not helping the case. Fortunately, over here on uh, the East Coast, at least, there's some level of normality. I'm no longer driving around with the uh, extra fuel tanks to power the generators, things of that sort. Uh, supplies, though, very, very scarce. I mean, I bought, I purchased 30 fans in addition to all the equipment we have, and I was out of them within 24 hours. All of our local Rental vendors are out of equipment. We're on wait lists. So that's kind of where we're at at this point. Thank you, Josh. That That's going to be a tough situation to work with. I know John had talked to me earlier about the equipment situation. Let's come back to that. But before we do, I want to go to Addison Christian. Addison is the owner of Adcon Environmental Services in Frederickstead, St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. He's got over 20 years' experience in asbestos 
uh, indoor air quality, disaster restoration, hazmat. He deals with medical waste, oil recycling, and also HVAC cleaning. He's also been a general contractor in the Caribbean for over 30 years and holds numerous certifications, license, and titles in related areas. He's also got a degree from, I believe it was American University, uh, Addison. I didn't get a chance to confirm that with you. Addison, do we have you on the line? I'm on the line. Great to good have you. Good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Can, Addison, are you in St. Croix today or are you headed over to St. Thomas? I'm in St. Croix today. And can you give mm-hmm. listeners a little update on how things are coming along in the Virgin Islands? Uh... It's a, a work in progress. Uh, probably the more damage has taken place um, in the Caribbean um, just because of the fact that the storm went over so many different islands, and some of the islands that went over, um, they went, it went directly over the storm. And because of the wide band, islands that were nearby also got destroyed. So um, you you know, in the U.S. Virgin Islands, of course, comprises of three islands, main islands, St. Croix, uh, the largest island, which is the, the southern and most eastern um, portion of the United States. Um, and then you have St. Thomas and St. John, <clears throat> which is in a Long Island chain along with, you know, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, the British Virgin Islands, and sort. So the storm pretty much ran, Hurricane Irma went over <clears throat> um, St. John. Practically, the eye wall scraped St. John and went directly over the British Virgin Islands. But because the eye wall, uh, the wall of the storm was, you know, or hurricane force winds were extending out, you know, approximately um, 75 miles, um, St. Thomas was right within that um, in that band and and took a great deal of damage. St. John took even more damage. So, uh, you know, it's you know just amazing. Uh, the force of Mother Nature. I mean, you have buildings, of course, without roofs, um, which is typically the biggest um, the biggest uh, uh, scene that you'll see. Um, a lot of wooden structures have just been completely, you know, flattened or, you know, just look like they've been obliterated. Um, but from that standpoint, um, you know, St. Croix pretty much just lost power. Um, no real damage other than a few power lines um, or a lot of power lines, you know, down or touching, um, you know, trees and, you know, that sort of stuff. So it's just been taking a little bit longer. We should be back to full power in St. Croix by uh, the 24th or the 25th of this month, they project. St. Thomas would not have power probably. It's going to take at least a minimum of six months. Um, They are completely uh, without power except for one small area near the power plant. There's still a lot of debris on the road because of the hilly nature of the island. Um, it's just extremely difficult to navigate and for first responders to get in there and to, uh, you know, to clear it out. Um, and other than that, I mean, it's just a matter. I mean, right now we're getting calls, you know, from clients in St. Thomas, in St. John, um, to, you know, respond with, uh, you know, um, you know, structural drying. Um, but it's it's a extremely difficult, um, you know, to manage from afar um, because, one, they have holes in roofs, so uh, the structures are compromised. Um, and then, of course, to get a proper drying, you're going to have to basically seal up those holes. So that's, you know, like the largest, you know, challenge that they're faced with. Um, last night, for instance, there was a torrential downpour, which was um, as a result of some of that swirling tail, um, you know, um, uh, let's call it weather debris from uh, Jose that just came over um, St. Croix and St. Thomas and, and dropped a torrent, almost like five, six inches of rain um, came down last night. So, you know, you have structures that are compromised, no roof, and then you had all of this extra rain coming that just tampered it. So it's just an extremely complex situation at this time. Addison, is, is the airport and the hospital open yet on St. Thomas? The hospital in St. Thomas is um, is out of service, um, at least mostly. Um, it's a four-story structure, um, and it lost the roof, which compromised, of course, the third, the, the fourth floor, and then also uh, the third floor. There was flooding, and then, of course, that water just continually probably ran all the way down into the 
lower section. Um, so it's not in. It's not going to be operational. Um, I'm sure they have plans right now for trying to set up a temporary structure while that is completely rebuilt. Um, the airport is closed in St. Thomas still. It should open for commercial traffic. They are estimating tomorrow. Part of the problem was with those um, 175 and 200 mile an hour winds is that the security uh, perimeter fence around the airport, at least 50% uh, of it was blown down. So um, you can't have commercial traffic coming in um, to an airport that doesn't have a you know secure perimeter as per you know TSA and federal regulations. So they've been working to get that up. I think they're almost there. The terminal itself in St. Thomas sustained um, some heavy damage. Uh, they had water intrusion, compromised roof um, in the main waiting area, um, which I'm pretty certain that they probably have that all cleaned up now in order to try and get commercial traffic resume, resume back in there. The only thing that's been flying into St. Thomas or the airport has been um, basically uh, private charters uh, or general aviation aircraft, military, um, medevac, uh, you know, types of um, uh, relief planes. Those are the only things in there. The ports are closed. Um, there's only one passenger ferry port that's open, um, and that's on the eastern end of St. Thomas um, for traffic back and forth to St. John um, passenger um, traffic. Uh, the other ports are closed. There's no commercial traffic uh, vessels coming in. So basically getting shipping containers of stuff in now, all of that's on hold. Um, unless you fly it in on a C-17, you know, um, uh, air, military aircraft. Wow. Sounds like they're going to have um, a long period of time where they're just going to be dealing with the, you know, the bare essentials of trying to get food and water, um, eventually getting electric exactly. back up. Uh, how are the people's spirits yep. um, that you've talked to? Are they, they hanging in there pretty well at this point? I think overall, most people now, the reality of the situation is sinking in. You know, usually whenever you have a natural disaster or some sort of disaster, you know, the first day it's shock, and that shock, you know, kind of wears out and goes from shock to anger and, you know, and disgust and, you know, just the things that you normally were able to do. It's like having five fingers and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you lose two of them. You know, you never realized how important those two missing fingers were. So, um, you know, they're they're... Initially, there was a curfew on all in all of the Virgin Islands from 6 p.m. Uh, no, 6 a.m. Uh, the day of the hurricane, which was Wednesday morning, until 6 p.m. Thursday um, evening. Um, on St. Croix, they lifted the curfew uh, the the Thursday um, in the morning at 8 a.m. and they left the curfew in place for St. Thomas because, of course, it had to most amount of damage. So they just recently, uh, they had restricted the curfew or, re or um, re relaxed it from 12, uh, the curfew ran from 6 p.m. in the evening until 12 noon, which basically gave residents only, you know, literally six hours to get out and, you know, to try and do whatever it is they wanted to do, which the biggest thing was trying to get gasoline for generators you know, there are lines at gas stations, you know, half of the gas stations had structural damage to their canopies. So, um, you know, there were just, I mean, lines like about a half a mile for people, you know, in, in vehicles or standing up with containers just trying to get gasoline. Um, so that, that has been a challenge. They just recently relaxed the curfew um, um, from 10 a.m. So your free period is from 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. And they did that uh, starting yesterday. So that's to help people get out. There are food distribution centers that are set up, um, you know, at three different locations on St. Thomas. The governor just authorized the um, opening of two more, um, one in St. John and an extra one in St. Thomas, specifically for um, the seniors to be able to get it. There are, you know, standard uh, FEMA military rations of MREs and, you know, water on site. I mean, there's adequate water and there's adequate food um, getting around there. They just started getting out the uh, blue tarps, um, you know, to residents so they can try to secure and, you know, at least temporarily waterproof their their living structures. Um, wow. 
But, it, you know, again, it's a long process, and just the basic essentials are, um, I mean, you have them. You know, I mean, there's, there's life. There is, uh, you know, there is access to food. There's access to water. Um, there is security. You know, we have uh, um, police, you know, local police, the National Guard, uh, military police. There is uh, um, contingency of some Marines, uh, a mix of, you know, federal agencies from U.S. Customs, Border Protection, um, Homeland Security, you know, DEA, FBI um, on island. You know, there haven't really been any security issues. There hasn't been, there wasn't any looting or anything, you know, as drastic as, you know, as that. And, of course, you know, there are always a few people that are going to try and, you know, the criminal element to take advantage of, you know, an opportunity. But I haven't heard of anything that has, um, you know, been successful. Wow. So it's been pretty well organized and, you know, and, and a pretty secure environment for, um, for recovery action. And for the most part, everybody's working together, you know. Good. I was able to get into St. Thomas on a charter flight with a client on Tuesday of this week and actually got to see the damage firsthand for myself. I was on the ground only for four hours because I had to do a moisture survey in, a, um, in an apartment complex that was under construction. And um, the drive to get there took us from the airport through – um, you know, the downtown, you know, up over the hills where there was a lot of damage. And so I got to see from the south side of the island to the north side of the island, you know, the ferocity, you know, trees basically, you know, almost looks like a bomb went off and, you know, trees and limbs are all broken and swayed, you know, no leaves on trees. You can see the bare ground. Um, but it's, um, it, it's, it's going to take some time and, you know, and a lot of, uh, you know, coordinated effort to get it there, you know. Well, thank you, Addison. We'll come back to you in a moment. Cliff, I want to go back to you for a minute and then, you know, go ahead and take your choice um, on who you want to follow up with and, and what you want to ask. Um, I guess, uh, you know, more with Addison, you know, you, you've told us about how, how everyone uh, else is doing. Uh, what about you? Did you suffer any personal damage at your residence or your office or you know, you, you, your business or anything? Uh, on my personal residence, uh, uh, I discovered some new uh, water loops <laughs> <laughs> that I didn't know I had. Um, uh, we didn't have a lot of high wind. Well, we had high wind. I'll take that back. Wind was probably up to 75 miles an hour. Um, so I've had, you know, just, uh, you know, coconut trees that are, you know, were pushed over. Uh, you know, minor damage. I mean, in comparison to the grand scheme of things, I mean, I really didn't have any damage whatsoever. St. Croix didn't really get any damage at all. Uh, we have storage locations, two uh, storage locations on St. Croix, warehouse space, um, and those things. Uh, we also have a warehouse space in St. Thomas uh, that I have been unable to access or find anybody else um, to be able to tell me how the... Um, that warehouse complex uh, did. I believe it did relatively well because it was a pretty sturdy and it was a brand new um, uh, facility. Um, we also have uh, storage uh, space, an eighth of an acre in St. John, almost like a lay down yard where we have a couple of shipping containers and um, on the property there. And I was unable to, you know, to find out um, how that fared. Um, and then also in the BVI, we have um, about uh, 300 square feet of rental space where I have about some, you know, air duct cleaning equipment um, and some other, you know, supplies inside there. And I've been unable to, to get a bead on how that storage complex um, has done. So if it has done like the rest of the island has done in the BVI, I can probably scratch off about $20,000 worth of equipment over there. The BVI Carol. being the British Virgin Islands. Um, British Virgin Islands, uh, island right. of Tortola. Yeah, they took a direct hit. Wow. So. All right. Uh, let me go back to John and Josh for just a minute here. John, I know when we talked earlier in the week, you brought up something to me that I found really fascinating and, and, and a little scary, and that is that um, a lot of equipment, re restoration equipment, apparently had been stored in, in your area in Orlando, and after Harvey had gone to Texas to help with the, you know, the disaster in Texas, uh, can you tell listeners a little bit about um, what kind of issues that's caused for you? 
Well, the, the lack of available equipment for restorers has become one of our primary concerns in Florida. Um, restoration contractors, large restoration contractors, will warehouse equipment in, in different key areas. Central Florida happens to be one of those. And in preparation for Harvey, tractor trailer loads of equipment was shipped to aid Harvey. Um, you'll see posts on social media where uh, Floridians are, are jokingly asking for their rednecks with boats and chainsaws back, please. <laughs> <laughs> the, the restoration equipment itself is going to be the most difficult thing that we have to contend with in the state of Florida. We just cannot get any equipment in the state of Florida. Every piece of equipment is probably in use with two or three points uh, of, of change ahead of it already scheduled. Wow. If we could ask for one thing, it would be restoration equipment. Um, and I know, Joe, that we have access to a little bit of equipment, and, I, and we'll talk after the show about a home for that. Okay. Um, one of the, the largest disaster recovery uh, teams, uh, led by Scott uh, Tarpley, is running a 50-vehicle convoy to the Keys for the sole purpose of drying out government buildings. He's probably got access to the only available equipment that could make its way there. Virtually everything else is in place and in use. And Josh, how are you doing with equipment? So you said earlier yours is all gone. Have you looked to, to outside people and others to, to bring in more equipment for you? Yeah. I mean, put it, one of our largest suppliers down here at Deval Safety, I mean, I scooped up the last of the equipment that they had. And, I mean, I'm on the phone with these guys. I'll call you back. No problem. I don't hear from them. I call back. And it's just that's kind of what it's been with everybody. And, I mean, I have been told two or three times now, right, because just clients' patience is running out. So then that gets passed on to the restorers to where it's just like, well, you know, crap. I need to get stuff in here. And then what it comes down to is obviously we put that pressure on the suppliers and they're all telling me the same thing, that everything was either in transit to Harvey uh, over in Texas, or it's already there, or that what is available, they're trying to get back, but it's been tied up in transit. And then the other issue that you have is it just, again, there's just uh, so many of these buildings were impacted that it's just, I mean, we started off with a residential sweep where that's really all we were doing. We had you know, one or two buildings that we were working in, but most of what we were doing was residential, which was great because these much larger firms or national franchises, I mean, they've been all inside of these buildings. But now it's to the point where, again, like I just told you before the show, I'm responding to a, uh, you know, a three-story flood over here in Fort Lauderdale. And, uh, you know, the building manager and the owner just came up to me and just said, I mean, how soon can we expect to get equipment in here? And I just literally looked at my operations manager and I was like, let's, Let's focus on the extraction effort. The second we get that up, we'll pull what we can. And the second we have equipment available, we'll get it in here. So that's that's where I'm at here. The, the situation Cliff, now has become more critical for the restoration contractors to understand there's a lack of equipment and we can't dry things out. Let's pull out what's wet. Let's apply an antimicrobial to stabilize the area and, and then wait for the equipment. The wrong thing to do is what some uh, restoration contractors are doing, is they're just getting the assignment of benefits signed and moving on to the next building. If we don't have the equipment, let's at least stick with the manpower necessary to get the bulk of the wet material out to mitigate some of the damage, because that will come back to bite you from the insurance company 90 days from now, 120 days from now. Cliff, I know Absolutely. you wanted to chime that's in like, here. Joe, that's, that's what we're working on here. We're, we're doing the same thing there. Cliff? Th th thanks, Joe. You, you know, guys, one of the things we ran into in Andrew, you know, in, in the early 90s was the same thing, lack of equipment. And, and one of the things that is commonly overlooked that you probably do have access to would be uh, chemical dehumidifiers, calcium chloride. You know, up in the north, you know, they use it for melting snow down, you know, where you're at. Uh, you know, it's called damp red. 
And you know, one of the things that you can do is you can hang, you can take. It comes in fifty-pound bags. Uh, you should be able to get it from chemical suppliers and so on and so forth. And what happens is you can hang, you can take a uh, a pillowcase and you can suspend that uh, from the ceiling. You need a bucket underneath it, you know, to catch the liquid, and it'll dry. I mean, you know, the same. It'll dry, and it's one thing that you probably have access to. Uh, immediately or you would have access to shortly because you know the, the manufacturers in the United States are running you know 24 hours a day seven days a week and if and it's just going to take too long to get the stuff in from China so one of the things I would give some thought to particularly in residential situations and in those jobs that are really not that bad would be to think about using uh, calcium chloride thank you Cliff. yeah giant pillow size damper it there you go. There you go. Gentlemen, we've got to stop and thank our sponsors. We'll be right back. We're going to bring Eric Shapiro on for the second half. We've got John Lapoterre. We've got Josh Winton. And we've got Addison Christian. Josh and uh, John are in Florida, and Addison is calling in from St. Croix. We'll be right back with the second half of the show. IAQ Radio would like to thank our association sponsors. The Indoor Air Quality Association, a nonprofit multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Visit them at IAQA.org. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, who use advanced sensor software technology and embedded computers to provide superior environmental test instrumentation. Visit them, wolfsense.com. IAQ marquee sponsors are... John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at iaq.net. Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Okay, we're back for the second half of our show. I want to bring in Eric Shapiro. Eric, you've got uh, kind of dual citizenship there. You're in New Jersey now, but I know you also have a place in Florida. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, um, what do you do? You have any comments or questions for the guys? And and you know, are you still considering heading down to Florida? How's your brother doing in Florida, etc.? Yeah. Well, look, my 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 brother's staying busy. Uh, uh, the hour before this phone call, uh, I just got a work order for a national account, so uh, probably the uh, the end of uh, next week, I'm heading down to the uh, Orlando area uh, to start a project, and behind that came a few other calls, but, you know, uh, my back and forth, uh, yes, I'll go down, I have some equipment from up here that uh, I'm going to be sending down, uh, not enough to even, you know, make a blip on a radar screen for what's needed there. Uh, but nonetheless, it'll go down there. And, uh, I'm kind of in a hold pattern because my experience from Katrina and, and a few other issues has been that, uh, at least from the mold aspects and stuff, uh, it, it's probably starting down there in Florida, but another two, three weeks from now is, uh, I, I guess when, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll really, really see some bad issues. And, uh, uh, my experience has been uh, listening to Josh and, and to John and all that stuff. I agree. I've experienced it all. But uh, after a while, it, it, sometimes it's like just get in and do the best you can. Uh, of course, something has to be done. And uh, with a lack of equipment and sometimes a lack of power, you can only do what you can do. Uh, and that, that's my take on it right now so I can and get my eyes on things for myself. Guys, I want to throw out a, a toss-up question here and, and just chime in. Um, for people like Eric and others that are looking at coming down and, and helping out, and, you know, obviously some people can volunteer their time, but many will have to, to try and um, make a little money and at least break even while they're there. First, let's start with um, if, they, if they were packing a truck, what would be the most important things to bring down on this first trip? And then, uh, secondly, what are some precautions you would give them? And, and you guys can pick and choose which you'd like to do. Let's start with John. 
Well, dehumidifiers and air movers are what we're going to need to dry these buildings out. Um, air scrubbers are, are always a benefit, but if I were to make room on the truck, I would make more room for air movers and dehumidifiers and leave the air scrubbers behind for now. Um, we need to pull out what's wet. We need to dry the rooms. We need to uh, move air across the wet building material. The restoration contractors need to focus on just drying and not drying the entire building. If we've got a wall that's wet, let's dry the wall. Let's tent it. Let's isolate it. Uh, we can use less equipment to dry out faster if we focus our drying. Um, a lot of times in situations like this, we'll see one fan drop off, but it's circulating in a large room. So for those that are, are coming down here, bring your equipment, bring containment uh, materials, and let's focus our drying efforts. That's where I would focus. And you Some mentioned... of the concerns... Go ahead. There, there is a lot of work to be had here, but if you're coming down to assess and to get assignment of benefits signed for future work, I would tell you don't waste your time coming to Florida. What we need is able-bodied people that are going to help apply corrective action to the building. This is a, an unfortunate situation. We're still uh, recovering from Matthew. Uh, the problem that we had in Matthew is that a lot of people came to our state they signed assignment of benefits, which kept others away, which also meant that the buildings take wet with additional damage for extended periods of time. So if you're coming down, bring your equipment, bring your crews, be prepared to put your equipment in place uh, to where it's going to benefit the building. But please don't come down here just to uh, try to sign up future work. So we, you, you do need uh, polyethylene, tape, things of that nature. Are those running short josh maybe you can jump in here uh polyethylene believe it or not because i'm a hoarder we've got plenty of we got plenty of excuse me plenty of that um again going back to john hitting the nail on the head i mean dehumidifiers fans what he said is exactly what we've had to resort to we've done things like this in specific situations right where you just have an area that you just need to physically bake, right? So you have two options. You either get heating equipment on there or you focus a dehumidifier and a fan and isolate it on one area using polyethylene to just kind of uh, isolate that area. Now, we're having to do that because, I mean, you're talking about some of these beachfront multi-million dollar properties that have, you know, I'm, I'm joking here, but 40-foot ceilings, and you can't just go in and drop an XL dehumidifier and expect that we're going to have to dry this thing. So we are absolutely having to uh, run through plastic too and isolate things, contain. And, uh, and now, unfortunately, we're at the point where we're at Thursday, yesterday, Thursday, today, Friday. Now we're starting to find uh, mold growth and things of that sort. So it's just uh, back to what John's talking about, where obviously let's get in there, let's take out what we can. Um, and John, chime in for sure with your thoughts here. But we're at the point where also being a little bit prudent and cautious here in that if it is a pretty well isolated area, even without power in some of these properties, if we can set up an isolation barrier, take out the wet material, you know, hook up a generator or a vacuum to a generator and at least clean up as best we can, it's, it's a damn good effort given the situation and not like uh, John's talking about guys just dropping off equipment, worsening the matter, signing up AOB. So. Now, you both mentioned... No. Uh, I want to get a quick quick comment in here. What about generators? Are, are you okay on generators, or do we should people throw a couple generators on just to be on the safe side? It sounds like electric's not back up everywhere yet. You get well, I, I, think, I think at this point, uh, generators are, are helpful to some degree, but our power, uh, according to um, the online statistics and the re reporting from our governor, we should have full power on by the 17th. So if anybody's packed up to come here again, I wouldn't make much room for generators. I think we'll be full, uh, fully lit up by the end of the weekend. I mean, it's it's really moving fast. We have more people in the state of Florida restoring power than any other time in the nation's history. We have people from as far away as Canada. We can't even begin to tell you how many electrical trucks we have in the state of Florida. They're staging at the malls. They're getting direction in the morning. They're rolling out, and they're heading back at the end of the day. 
the, in many areas, they've got police escort. So at, at this point, I would say generators are a much lower priority. And there's one critical thing that we did forget to mention is pressure washers. Load your pressure washers and bring them with you. We want to implement as much of the Pittsburgh protocol as we can in the state of Florida. If people are not familiar with that, I, I think we should defer to Cliff to explain the Pittsburgh protocol because this needs to be disseminated throughout the state of Florida. As our rivers rise, as they crest and begin to, re to recede, the best application for these residential homes that were flooded is the Pittsburgh Protocol. Having Cl said that, I would defer to, to Cliff to explain the Pittsburgh Protocol for the audience. Cliff, if you uh, could. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, John. The Pittsburgh Protocol is basically very simple. Uh, the first thing we want to do is apply... Uh, an antimicrobial, and we want to use a concentrated one. I mean, you can go to, uh, you know, Sam's Club. There's a product called Otoban. You know, there are many of these cleaner disinfectant products that are sold in the concentrated form. And what we like to do with it is we like to uh, apply it with a pressure washer. And, you know, we'll utilize this to remove... Uh, you know, heavy debris to remove mud and, and so on and so forth. If we have surfaces that have visible fungal growth on them, one of the things we'll do is we'll apply an antimicrobial solution in the form of a foam so that it clings and sticks to those surfaces. One of the nice things about many of the antimicrobials is they come with an added benefit. Many of them are antifungal for significant periods of time. It could be days, weeks, even a couple of months. So the one thing you don't want to do is, is when you're clean, you don't want to wash the antimicrobial off with water. You want to leave it on. But the pressure washers are great for getting in, you know, for dealing with, uh, you know, river, riverine flooding and, and, you know, just the surface water flooding because it gets into the cracks gets into the crevices, it's much, much faster than, than any of the other techniques. And actually, uh, FEMA recommends it now. Yeah, there's a Hurricane Sandy fact sheet that goes over the foaming and power washing. And um, we'll, we have that on our website, but we'll put it up again with Cliff's blog. Um, maybe we can add it. I don't know if it was in last week's blog or not, Cliff, but we can we can add that after the fact. So uh, we'll get that out there. Addison, let me turn it over to you for just a moment. Um, you, you're not in Florida. You're in St. Croix. You've got your own unique kind of issues with respect to um, people coming in and helping. I wonder if you'd like to comment on that. Um, yeah, coming in, you know, there's always help to be needed. The biggest problems are going to be logistics, uh, and that's going to be um, housing. Housing is going to be your biggest, your biggest problem. Um, some of the hotels were damaged, uh, so there is definitely a shortage of, um, of uh, rentable space um, on the island. And uh, those spaces that may have been free have first responders more than likely um, staying in there, which further complicates it even more. So. Um, availability of space is going to be the first thing. Uh, the next thing, of course, is going to be um, basically equipment. Um, I'm probably the only person that has, you know, DUs or any kind of drying equipment um, anywhere around here. Um, and all my stuff is, is being utilized on a couple of government projects. So, um, and there aren't any really r rental places to do it. So if you're bringing equipment, if you're coming, you have to bring equipment. That's going to be uh, equipment and manpower. So, and that, but then again, like I said, the logistics, those are a problem. Would the equipment be shipped in typically, and are there a lot of obstacles to, you know, uh, getting things shipped into St. Croix or St. Thomas, or would you ship to St. Croix or to try to get straight to St. Thomas? Um, I would believe that currently the ports in St. Thomas are closed, but I... I'm certain they're going to be open, you know, uh, any day now. Um, all shipping basically comes in through South Florida. So, as you know, Irma left, you know, the Caribbean and went straight through Florida, which disrupted not only air travel but also um, uh, shipping, commercial shipping traffic, 
uh, coming down to this region. So, but that's that's the direction and flow of where your equipment would come from, and also your direction of travel would come from. Okay, and that's going to be tough with the way things are right now. So uh, you guys have some real challenges. Yeah, it, we'll, we'll continue to follow up with you over the next month or two here and, and see how things are coming along. We're not going to let this drop. We're going to go back and, and talk about Harvey. I did get um, Ed Cross, the restoration attorney, to uh, agree to join us in a couple of weeks here, and uh, we're going to continue to try and help while we can. John, I've got a question for you I think is an important one. Florida has state licensing. Um, in, in another week or so, mold's going to become a huge issue. They have uh, state licensing requirements for people to do mold assessment and remediation. Is there any talk about, uh, like in Texas, relaxing that or um, maybe a, uh, putting putting a time period where people don't have to have that licensing so they can come down and help out? We, we expect that to happen. It hasn't happened yet. But uh, in, in most cases, there is a suspension on that requirement. Um, these things are, are kind of slow in coming. So the, the first um, extension came for uh, filing a claim. There was a 90-day extension on uh, those impacted by the hurricane to, to file an insurance claim. Uh, typically, shortly after that, once uh, everything settles down a little bit and the first responders start to show up, we'll see the, uh, the re- release of the restriction requiring you to have a state license. But we would like to add one, one thing in that. Well, I don't think it's necessary for your restoration contractor or first responder to have a state license. There are many, many qualified uh, in and out of the state of Florida that that don't have a license. But the easiest way to determine whether or not you're having a good uh, first responder on your job is to check with the IICRC, the RIA, uh, DADCA, um, ACAC, or the Indoor Air Quality Association. Look up their history. Ask for references. Don't let somebody come in that is, from Florida or outside of Florida without any references. This isn't the time to take the low bidder. This is the time to take the people that can actually help you. So please, check references. John, what about um, just a contractor's license for those that are, you know, I I don't know if it's required for tearing out drywall, for pulling out carpet, but certainly for putting it back, I would think. Um, Can you expand on that just a little bit? Depending on where you are in the state of Florida, individual counties can have additional licensing requirements. So a general contractor can perform mold remediation so long as it's within the scope of his work, and he's not advertising himself as a mold remediator. Um, He can perform uh, the, the restoration work. However, if you're a restoration contractor and you want to reinstall drywall, now you're acting outside the scope of your work and you're acting as a general contractor, and many counties would require you to have a general contractor's license. So first responders would be allowed to respond by removing water, removing water-damaged building material, but in many counties, if you try and put that back for a profit, you're going to be in violation of state licensing laws. And what's the chances they're going to be watching for that kind of thing at this point in time? I mean, is it not 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 that I'm encouraging people to break the law, but um, do, uh, is there any kind of enforcement occurring right now? What about like asbestos abatement, things like that? Asbestos is a little bit different. Um, we're, we're talking federal versus county. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I don't I don't know that there will be a lot of it enforced now. Uh, But six months from now, it can rear its ugly head. So uh, those of you performing commercial work, let's look for prior asbestos surveys or get in line with your samples. But uh, you've definitely got to cover yourself there. As far as um, the drywall replacement, I highly doubt that even the most strictest of counties would stop anybody from restoring someone's home during this time of loss. However, we both know that a month ago, there were jobs that were being halted for the replacement of drywall without a license. So I, I don't think they would push that issue at this point. But uh, asbestos and, and lead-based paint, I would say adhere as close as you can to the, the federal guidelines. 
or it can bite you six months from now. All right. Great, great, uh, great comments from you, John. I think what we're going to do is go to the roundup. We're going to come back and ask each guest a final question. Cliff, we'll be right back. Move him on, hit him up, hit him up, move him on, move him on, hit him up, raw high. Cut him out, ride him in, ride him in, let him out, cut him out, ride him in, raw A little shout out to Spike. I need a new, I need a new uh, roundup uh, music intro here. But anyway, let's go around. Cliff, any final questions for our guests? No, no final questions, really, Joe. I, I think one thing, though, is, you know, I think it shows, uh, you know, what America is all about, the, the way that people, you know, get together and, and help one another in these times of need. And, you know, the one thing that, none of us really think about that often is, uh, you know, our military. I mean, they're on guard all over the world, keeping us safe. And, uh, you know, they, they live under these conditions pretty much on a daily basis. So uh, just a shout out to them. Very good. Now, gentlemen, I'd like to just go around and, and ask each of you a final question. And that is, are there any lessons you've learned in the, you know, prior responses or during this one that you'd like to pass along to listeners and or is there anything at all we missed that you'd like to add and uh i think i want to start with addison and then i'm going to go to josh and then come back to john because john i'd like you also to comment on what iaqa may be doing to assist with this uh, particular situation where we've got major recoveries occurring um in several large uh, highly populated areas of the country. So let's start with Addison. Final thoughts, final comments. Well, natural disasters, we can't ever, um, you never know when they're going to come around, and it's uh, extremely difficult to, uh, to pre plan. But, you know, this disaster and restoration uh, contractors, uh, the most important thing that we can do is always be prepared, you know. Um, just like the guys in Florida, you know, they have in stock you know, equipment and supplies um, to the best extent possible in order to be able to respond to their clients, you know, needs. Uh, that's extremely um, important. And then, of course, you know, getting out that correct information and, um, you know, reinforcing it, as John was saying, you know, don't leave it wet. You know, you can't get dehumidifiers. You can't get this equipment. At least, you know, do the bare minimum, you know, remove the wet material, you know, get airflow, air circulation going inside there, you know, with blowers. So that's very helpful. Addison, I know you you went you've been through a lot of storms in your lifetime. I mean, living on St. Croix most if not all of your life. I know you spent time here in college, etc., maybe a little little time in other uh parts of of the mainland, but is this the worst one you've seen or or have there, have there been worse uh worse hurricanes come through? Oh. Well, for myself, um I was actually, I experienced Hurricane Hugo. Um, I was here. I slept through the first part of it um, until something heavy, I don't know what it was, a 55-gallon drum got slammed up against the plywood against the window, and that woke me up. Um, But lost the roof, I mean, and went nine months without power. So what's taking place in St. Thomas, I've been through that before. And then, of course, living down here in the Caribbean, we have every year, you know, the storms, uh, and hurricanes, they pass through this region. So um, I would say that, you know, I can sympathize with all these other islands and, you know, Florida and, you know, the damage that has taken place because, you know, I've, I've gone through it many a time before. So, and it's not pleasant. But you can't, you have come back and uh, people can't come back. They've just got to, I guess, keep their head down and keep putting one foot in front of the other. That's it. Every day. It is a better day than the day than yesterday. Well said. You know, you keep telling yourself that, and that's what you keep looking for, looking for the, you know, the bright side. And it's you know, it, there's also the psychological side, as you know, where you know people see this destruction and then they you know get into a mode of uh, you know of uh, desperation and and depression, um, you know. And so you know, the best thing, of course, then is to try and you know, if you can't pick yourself up, is having people to recognize that you know people are going through that and. You know, just being there for that emotional and physical support, you know, is extremely important. Well said. And thank you for joining us. I know, you know, you weren't even sure if you would have a cell phone reception, and, and we appreciate uh, you joining us today. 
let's shoot over to uh, Josh. Josh Winton. Um, Josh, any final thoughts, final comments, um, anything you've learned that you'd like to pass along to listeners? Uh, yeah. Sorry, let me walk away from the loud machine Okay. Um, sorry about that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No problem, Josh. Um, <laughs> uh, passing on to listeners, basically the best thing we can say, I mean, uh, obviously what, what homeowner, uh, the biggest factor that I'm seeing is we need to know the classifications of water. So, I mean, any restorers that are out there listening, I mean, um, and I, I know John's big on this stuff and everything of that sort, but like I said, fortunately, we're dealing with wind-driven rains. A lot of these uh, Fort Lauderdale beachfront properties have flooded water, so, I mean, you're dealing with bacteria and all sorts of other crap that is just, you know, not mold and water-based there. So uh, know the classifications of water that we're dealing with here. I mean, the building I'm standing in here, we have shortages of water. This is a time that there are no enemies. I'm here with a carpet cleaning company that's looking to me as the restorer to get everything in here, and I'm telling them to bring in anything and everything they have. Everyone is running low on equipment, so it's just a matter of your enemies are now your friends, and they never should have been your enemies in the first place. Well, thank you, and, and thanks for joining us, Josh. And, and I want to add something, too, real quick before I finish up with uh, John Lapoterra. And, Pete, I noticed that the watchdog joined us. If you have anything to chime in with, just send us a text so we know. But um, I, I, I spoke to a very lo- – the, the biggest – contractor in, in my area here um, yesterday we had a nice long talk about this whole issue and um, you know one of the things I think that, that kind of goes back to what Addison said is you've got to have enough materials and be prepared and be ready but um, don't take all those materials down south and then not be ready to service your customers where you're from I think that's a big mistake a lot of people make and and especially people that are newer to the industry, they, they want to go down, they want to help, they sometimes want to make the, the money uh, from going down and helping. And then some smart uh, guy that's been around for many years is just kind of sitting back here waiting for you to go ahead and abandon some of your better clients, and then uh, they'll scoop them up. So make sure you're able to cover both bases before you go running off to take care of other people. Uh, make sure you can take care of home. And, uh, John, I'd like to finish with you. Uh, any final thoughts, any final, um, you know, words of wisdom, things you've learned over your many years in Florida and uh, dealing with hurricanes for listeners? And then any uh, final thoughts about what IAQA may be doing to help with this particular uh, situation? Yeah, Joe, this is Lydia and I's eighth uh, hurricane, not including named storms, eight, eight hurricanes. We don't chase storms. We stay here with our local clientele. Um, it, it would be difficult for us to to leave, and I think your advice is is very good for a lot of restoration contractors. Um, there is plenty of work here in our local community. Uh, plenty of people that need um, our help and our professional expertise. Keep it local. Um, I, I think that's some of the best advice. I think it's also important for people to know and understand the value of the Pittsburgh Protocol, um, know and understand how to categorize uh, water, know the benefit of chemical usage in a time like this, uh, but be careful on how and where and when you apply it. I think it's extremely important for Florida to recognize and thank local and state government for the way that they helped us through this, law enforcement who kept us safe during this, first responders that helped us evacuate during this event, the power company, who is up to 12,000 individuals from many different states, uh, helping us get power back on quicker than anybody thought would be possible in the largest state power outage in our nation's history. <clears throat> More importantly, I think it's important to, to recognize how an event like this in a country as great as ours can bring neighbors together neighbors that may have never known each other who are now friends. I think this event has brought us closer together as a country, even though it's a great time of loss. As for the Indoor Air Quality Association, we're working very hard to disseminate as much information as we can internally to our members as a member benefit 
than externally through social media to anyone that we can reach. We're in the process of putting in place um, a representative in Houston and several across the state of Florida that can provide us written reports through social media on the status of the hurricane relief. Shelters, power outages, food, lodging, I think those things are critical for us. And what I'd like to do is ask our staff at IAQA to contact Addison so maybe we can do the same thing in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Fantastic. And, uh, John, we appreciate that. I've been watching your your uh, your email blast that uh, go out to the members and give information and uh, get them some resources and then reaching out to the general public. I think that's all important. And, of course, we appreciate the uh, sponsorship of IAQ Radio here, and uh, we try and make sure we get the word out as well. So we uh, – oh, and I see um, one of the – one of the listeners has posted the uh, Pittsburgh protocol here. We'll make sure we get that in the blog as well. And um, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, keep up, keep up the great work. And uh, again, we we really appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, this is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks so much to this week's guests. We had a, a great show with John Lapoter. Josh Winton and Addison Christian and uh, we'll be back next Friday at noon we're going to do an IAQ show next Friday at noon I've got uh, Brandon Bohr Dr. Bohr coming back on and uh, one of his associates from over in um, I guess it might be like the France or the Netherlands I, I don't have it in front of me here but it'll be up on the website real soon we're going to talk a little more indoor air quality and then the following week we'll be back with some more on the two hurricanes we're covering here. I think we'll, we'll get back into Texas first and see how things are coming along there. I noticed I haven't heard a word about Texas on, on the national news here recently, which I'm a little disappointed by. They told them they weren't going to abandon them, and then when Florida hit, uh, that's all I heard, which is understandable at first, but hopefully we can keep a little pressure on them to continue covering both places. So this is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks once again to our guests, of course, to my engineer, John, you got to have faith, my co-host, the Z-Man, and most importantly, you, our loyal listeners. We'll see you next Friday at noon for the next broadcast of IAQ Radio. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reel saying thanks for listening.